Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual program with Turnstile Tours. Uh, my name is Andrew Gustafson. I'll be your host today. Uh, we have a very special program, and, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us, because today we're celebrating uh, the 230th birthday of the United States Coast Guard. So today's program is going to uh, be sort of in two parts. Uh, for the first part, we're actually going to bring on a former colleague of ours and Coast Guard veteran, Ramon Ortiz, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what it's like serving uh, in the Coast Guard in New York Harbor. Uh, and then for the second part of the program, we're going to dive into the history, going back to 1790 and, and coming all the way up to the present day, uh, or as much as we can cover uh, in the time that we have. Um, just a couple things uh, to note uh, about how the program works. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, thank you so much um, for joining us and for your support. Uh, if you're a longtime visitor, uh, you probably know all of this already, but um, Turnstile Tours, we are a tour company. We typically give tours of New York City uh, in the flesh. Uh, we haven't been able to do that actually since March 11th as a result of the pandemic. And so we've taken our programming uh, and our partners uh, and our expertise online. Um, so this is I think 120th or so program uh, that we've done. And we do these virtual programs about three times a week. Uh, some of them are free like this one. Uh, some of them are paid. Um, and we also have a membership program. But I just wanted to share with you um, a little bit about what we have uh, coming up as people are still joining um, the program. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so uh, these, this is what we have coming up uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, so. Uh, this Friday, um, we work with a lot of different artists, uh, and so we're going to have back an artist we had at the very beginning of the program uh, back in March, uh, Red Jen Miller, and she's going to show off some of her amazing paintings uh, of the cats of Coney Island. Uh, then on the 8th, uh, we also do a lot of programs about um, New York City's food system, and so we're going to bring on a couple of designers who actually created a board game uh, that illustrates how the food system works and particularly the Hunts Point Market up in the Bronx. Um, then on the 10th, we're going to continue our nautical uh, programming where we're going to have um, folks from the Coney, uh, excuse me, the City Island Nautical Museum. We're going to talk about the rich boat building history of City Island. Uh, then on the 13th, uh, we are going to take a virtual field trip. We're going to go out in the field and, and visit the Prospect Park Zoo, um, but we're not going to focus so much on the animals. We're actually going to focus on the art and architecture of that really beautiful facility. Um, then on the 15th, um, we are really kicking off a series that we're going to be doing um, over the course of the next month um, throughout August and September, uh, and that's really focusing on the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. And we're going to talk about World War II today uh, quite a bit, um, but for our kickoff program, which marks the actual day that the, the war ended, um, we are going to um, take a deep dive into the oral history collection um, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard and actually listen to the voices um, of men and women uh, who lived through that time period. Um, then on August 18th, we're going to talk more about food, um, where we're going to visit Grand Champs, uh, which is a Haitian restaurant. Uh, that's actually in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, but stay tuned for more of our World War II 75th anniversary programming um, as we, uh, we'll, we'll be rolling that out um, over the next week or so. Um, as I said, it'll go through September. We already have uh, scheduled a program we're going to do on September 2nd uh, about the USS Missouri and the USS Arizona, two ships that played a very important role in World War II, um, and both of which are uh, were built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So we'll talk about those ships' um, really illustrious history. Um, and just a little plug here, you know, we really couldn't do these programs without your support. Uh, so we have been able to do all this virtual programming, despite the fact that we can't give any tours in person, um, really thanks to our, our viewers, our supporters, and our subscribers. Um, so if you want to get access to all of those programs, both the free programs as well as the paid programs, as well as our library of over 120 past uh, recorded programs, um, you can join our membership program. Um, and so it starts at just $5 a month um, and uh, goes up to $20 a month and there's different benefits. So you can visit our website, just go to turnstiletours.com uh, slash membership and you can see more about what, what we have to offer. Um, but we're, we're, we've really been so lucky. We've gotten this incredible um, groundswell of support uh, from people who you know, have come, 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 our, 
come on our tours in person, um, but also from people who've never been on our tours, never even been to New York City. Um, so we really, really appreciate that. So I, I just want to thank you all so much. Um, so without further ado, um, oh, sorry, just a couple more things I want to mention here, which is how the program is going to work. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, we ask you to drop those into the chat. Um, so that's how we're going to communicate with one another. Um, so you can find the chat um, down at the bottom of your screen. And to join the chat, um, you'll notice that there are two options that you can select. You can either select all panelists, which will just go to me, uh, basically me and um, Cindy, who is our producer today. Um, but if you want everybody to see your comment, your question, just select all panelists and attendees. Um, and then lastly, uh, we do have closed captioning. So uh, if you wanna turn that on or off, uh, Stefan is typing away behind the scenes what I'm saying right now, um, but you can do that down at the bottom of the screen if you're on a computer. If you're on a phone or a tablet, you just need to exit out of this session, um, go into the settings uh, and turn the captioning on or off and then log back into this session. Um, so, if you have any technical issues or any questions, feel free to drop that into the chat and Cindy will, will help you out right there. Um, so without further ado, um, I wanna bring on our very special guest today, uh, Ramon Ortiz, who is a Coast Guard veteran and Coast Guard reservist. Um, and he's gonna share uh, some images and a little bit of a few stories about uh, his experience and his time um, working in New York Harbor, because that's uh, really what we're uh, focusing on um, today uh, is the history of the Coast Guard in New York Harbor. Um, so Ramon, I'm just going to invite you to uh, start your video here. Hey. Hey, Ramon. How's it going? Hi, everybody. Hey, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for, for agreeing to do this. Uh, it's great to see you. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. Um, so this is this is a really great opportunity. Uh, where are you joining us from? So currently I'm up in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, it's my hometown. It's where I grew up. So we're up here, you know, trying to beat the heat. Um, but I'll be back home on Staten Island um, pretty soon. And that's where I currently reside full time. Yeah, I'll admit I'm also out of the city right now. Uh, I'm uh, up at my uh, mother's home in Vermont, trying to beat the heat a little bit. Um, but we also have the terrible weather here, like you're probably experiencing in, in New York City right now. Um, yeah, so why don't we start off, tell us a little bit about, you know, when you joined the Coast Guard and, and why you decided to join the Coast Guard. Um, sure. Uh, so I decided to join the Coast Guard probably around 08, 2008. And it took a while, you know, the service didn't need that many people. It was right after the recession. So it took a long time for there to be a rack open in boot camp. But finally I got in and I, you know, went to boot camp and around May of 2010, I reported uh, on board the Sturgeon Bay, uh, home ported in Bale, New Jersey. So I, I joined because, you know, I grew up in Gloucester, Mass, on an island, you know, on the boats. We have a small boat station here. My friend, uh, he was a uh, coastie. My cousin was a coastie. It just, something about it just called to me. And, you know, I was, uh, I joined late. I joined at age 24. And, it, you know, so it was that time in my life where it's like, let's make a concrete decision. Uh, something that I can do for a career and the Coast Guard just kept calling to me, so I joined. That's great. Um, and did you expect that you would wind up uh, in, in New York Harbor? No, uh, that was, no, I expected to be on a white hall going somewhere to South America. Um, but at boot, in boot camp, you know, at the time you, they gave you a wish list. You get to put down three places and I don't know, I seemed to be homesick. So I just wanted to stay somewhere in the Northeast where I could get back home uh, to friends and family. And, you know, the Surgeon Bay was my third pick. I don't remember what the other two were. I'm pretty sure they were uh, out of Boston. But, you know, I got my third pick in the Surgeon Bay. Didn't know anything about it. Didn't have a clue. They don't really tell you much at boot camp where you're going and what that's going to be like. So, you know, the first night, uh, I took a train to Newark from Boston. One of the seamen on board picked me up. And so the first time seeing the big black hull, wasn't what I thought it was going to be. You know, you see the, the, the pamphlets, it's a big, beautiful white hall with a Coast Guard stripe. This was not it. This was a big black 
pig, which is what we call her. She's a work boat. So it was an interesting first meeting with the boat. And can, could you explain the differences, if, if people don't know, between what, what that means in Coast Guard parlance, a white hull versus a black hull? Yeah, so the first thing is the size, the size alone. Uh, it's a tugboat. It looks like your regular tugboat. It's designed for ice breaking, but it's just 140 feet. Um, so there's that, the, the, the size, the shape. And if it's a black hull, it's a working boat. Um, you know, home ported also in Bayonne, we have things like the, the Katie Walker, they, they're buoy tending. Um, we're designed for ice breaking. So, and you know, in the Midwest, for example, there's, there's river barges that are cutters to work in, in those conditions. So we, we're, we're the work hard, play hard kind of uh, cutters and crews uh, versus our white hull brethren that, you know, they're dealing right now with migrant interdictions, uh, drug interdictions down in, in, the salt, in the south and in the gulf, possible rescues during hurricane conditions like we have now. They have the capacity to carry a helo if they have to. Um, and their crews are huge, just a couple hundred people on board and they go out for longer. I think the longer, the longest we could stay out is a week or two at the time, um, where we have to pull in for fuel and for stores. Well, those guys can be out there for a month or so. Um, so there's, there's differences uh, in our capabilities, but our training is all the same, we're pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we pull up a few pictures and so uh, hopefully that will help people visualize a little bit about what your experience was like. Um, sure. So again, our, our, so that's a young me. Um, the mustache is awful. It's one of the things we do when we get underway. We find ways to not have to shave as much because, um, you know, it eats into your sleep time. But uh, I'm pretty sure that's somewhere in the Atlantic going south. Um, the waters look too, too welcoming. Um, but, and so again, like Andrew said, our, we're an icebreaker. That's our primary tasking in New York Harbor and up the Hudson River was to go all the way up to as far as Albany to break ice, but, and also ports and waterways security on the East River, on the Hudson, in New York Harbor during the summer and spring, you know, when there is no ice breaking tasking permissions to be had. But uh, we're versatile. The Coast Guard's a very small uh, service. So, and crews like ours, we're on the Surgeon Bay, we're only 18 of us, uh, three officers and everybody else is enlisted. So we all become kind of jack of all trades and that's kind of how the Coast Guard is, where some providers always ready. You have to be always ready to, to take on a new job. It may not be what fall, falls under your responsibilities, but you're gonna do it anyways, you're gonna learn it. Um, and the same thing with our units, like Surgeon Bay, again, designed for ICE, but we actually were tasked to go help um, with the BP oil spill um, down in the Gulf. Um, we ended up steaming all the way from New York down to uh, Panama City, Florida. Um, this is half, this is not even halfway there, but this is our port call in Key West. We're pulling in uh, for fuel and for stores and to give us a break. We had actually hit a storm off Cape Hatteras and that nobody sleeps during a storm. And again, our boat's designed for a harbor like New York Harbor or for the Great Lakes. It's like a big football in the water. So once we get out into open waters, nobody gets any rest. Nobody's walking straight for a while. Um, but this was one of our more unique taskings uh, as a cutter. But again, most of the time we were here in New York Harbor, ice breaking or doing security zones for the UN General Assembly. Um, you know, this is only about nine years after 9-11. So we're still very on high alert, looking out for bridges and, and, and things of that, securing, making sure that the waterways are clear for, for vessel traffic. Um, but this was a very unique situation. Obviously, it affected our whole nation and the environment and Coast Guard needed to do our job as one of our missions is to protect the environment. So they sent us down there. But that's just me on the... Uh, and how long did it take you to get get from New York to, uh, uh, to the Gulf? Yeah, so the trip down was a lot longer than it should have been. Again, we hit a storm and we were against the uh, jet stream. So I think it was about seven to 10 days. And again, we had that port call. I think we were in Key West for like two days and a half or something like that. But on the way home, I do remember it was a lot faster. We caught that jet stream. I don't think it took us more than four or five days. Um, once we left once we left Key West, it was like a two, three day steam. We just flew, the jet stream just helped us out a lot. But uh, yeah. It, it prepared, let's put it this way, it prepared me and us, anybody who served for quarantine, because you have 140 feet 
and there's 17 other people there with you. So you really get used to like making the best of the space that you're working with. Um, the fan tail is great, you know, for, you know, if you're not on duty or doing your rounds or sleeping, the fan tail on the back of the boat is great. Do some fishing. I would do exercises back there. Some of the guys, you know, would, you know, like an old sailor, they would light up their, 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 their pipe and just relax and, and watch the sunset. So, you know, it's hard work. It really is hard work. But, you know, we also find ways to keep each other entertained, keep each other uh, going um, and motivated uh, to keep doing the job. Um, even if you're and, on the way for, for such a long period. And, and just so people understand, you know, even though you're, you're birthed in Bayonne, you know, most, most of the time you're operating in the harbor, you're not living in an apartment in Manhattan, right? You're no. living on the boat. So interesting you say that because the first eight months of my, after I reported on as an E2, as a seaman from boot camp, I reported, um, I had to live on board for eight months. Uh, and so on board, the warrant officer was living on board. He was geo-bacheloring, which means his family was in Florida, but it was just easier for him to live on board. Uh, there was another two people, another two non rates like myself living on board. And the, we got to move into housing, meaning like an apartment in Bayonne, after we became qualified at the at our tasking site. So I had to get Helms qualified. I had to get uh, JOD, which is junior officer of the deck qualified, in port watch qualified. Mm -hmm. So once I got qualified in all those things, then I would be allowed to move, move out. Just when I was about, about to move out into the economy, we call it, um, the BP oil spill happened. So they were like, nope, you're not moving out. We're gonna keep you on board. So it wasn't until we came back from the BP oil spill, I got to live in Bayonne um, in a normal apartment. I got to have all my stuff out of storage. I was living out of a backpack, a sea bag. Literally, I was living out of my sea bag. And, um, but yeah, we, we don't live the New York City life and you know, in the Manhattan life. And we definitely weren't getting paid like it either. Um, and this is, you know, we're young. If you see on our left uh, chest, we all have probably one ribbon. Uh, national defense ribbon that's like everybody gets that once you join uh, pretty much we're all these are all, these guys these are my my crewmates we're all non rates at this time we don't have a specialty um, we're just you know doing the import watches doing the rounds learning the ropes um, and it's a great system because a lot of other services you go straight from boot camp to school for a specialty whereas with the Coast Guard you go from boot camp to your unit, like the Sturgeon Bay, and you get to see what the ratings and what the jobs are. And, and you may I, I, you come in with an idea of what you want to do, but you might change your mind because you see that maybe you want to be an electrician's mate. Maybe you don't want to be a bosun's mate. Maybe you want to be a mechanic's mate. So it's, it's, it's a good system. And um, the Seaman Morales on my right, he was, he's the first, he impressed me because my first time underway, I had to break in under him so I could learn how to be a helmsman. And I'm 25 years old, he's 19, and he's at the helm. We, we, you know, we take that left coming out of Moffey in Bayonne, our terminal where we moor up, and the traffic in New York City, summertime, ferries, pleasure crafts, you know, uh, tankers and whatnot. And he's at the helm teaching me how to drive, you know, and I'd never driven that big a boat. I'd never been in New York Harbor, and he's just handling it. He's calling out vessels, he's grabbing the radio, he's teaching me how to do it. And I, it was just the most impressive thing I'd ever seen. Um, and again, like I said, I'm a 25 year old, he's a 19 year old and he's teaching me the ropes. And, and that's how the Coast Guard is. You're always learning from the guy above you and teaching the next guy up. Um, and and that's, that's what makes our service strong, I think. Um, one of the cooler things, again, a lot of random tasking in New York is an exciting place. Uh, ice breaking is great. The security zone is great, but the Super Bowl for us is Fleet Week especially if you don't have to, if your boat's not tasked with being out in the water for any security zones, which we had been in the past. But this, my first year, we actually got the moor up next to the Canadian vessel that was in town and the Katie Walker, and we got to enjoy Fleet Week. We got to, you know, go out into the streets. I think this is aboard the Intrepid. We were taking a tour. Um, and so this was great, you know, as a, as a non-rate that's new to New York City and to the Coast Guard, just to see Fleet Week and, and, and just be awed by all of it. The next year wasn't as fun. We had to stay on the boat and, and do security zone, but we already got our mm -hmm. fill. So it was, it's all good. <laughs> right. So we have some great questions um, from the audience that I want to share with you. Um, sure. So let me get out of here. Okay. Um, so uh, 
Mary wants to know, uh, she has two questions. One, did you ever get seasick? Ah, uh, seasick, let me see, when did this? No, I had a trick. So again, our, our, our cutter is designed for New York Harbor. It's nice and calm, believe it or not. It's, the harbor is really calm, and then if you're breaking ice up ice, and you're just ramming into things, you're in control. But when we hit that storm off the of Cape Hatteras, it's a football in water. And I was proud enough to say that I didn't get seasick. Uh, and I found a trick. The trick was don't eat dinner, you know, don't eat whatever's for dinner. Um, don't drink anything really, just Pop Tarts and Graham Crackers. That was my trick, the Bosis Mate trick. Uh, you know, there's so many times you'd get called to the bridge because somebody was just very ill, they couldn't keep going. We didn't sleep for two nights. Most of the guys just spent the night in the galley or we slept on the decks because you were gonna fall out of your rack. But I luckily wasn't seasick. I'm trying to remember uh, if I was. I don't think I was seasick. I just remember that was my trick. And I tell people nowadays, just grand crackers and Pop-Tarts, just dry yourself up. Don't eat dinner. Don't do Gatorade or anything. You're only gonna feel worse. Um, we just ride it out. But yeah, people get seasick. Even guys that have been in 15, 20 years, you never know when it's your turn. There's not much you can do to control it. And, and Mary also asks, uh, when you're living on the boat, were there any practical jokes that guys played? No, thank God, because we'd all, you know, we'd all lived on a boat, and it's your home, and, you know, it's hard, the job is really hard. It's really mentally and physically and spiritually demanding, um, and then so when you pull in or it's time for you to hit the rack, you get three hours, 45 minutes of sleep, you, you, you got to get that guy rested, because it's also safety, so he's got to go up to watch, he's got to be fresh, um, and even if we're in, in court, as soon as we pull in, if you don't have watch, you're gone whether you're pulling into Bayonne, whether it's we're pulling into Pier 88 or up the river in, in, at West Point, um, you just want off the boat. You want to feel normal for a little bit. You want to get a, a decent meal, maybe some exercise. Uh, just, we, we're all, you know, it's like a brotherhood. We love each other, but at the same time, first chance you get to, to spend a couple minutes away from each other, it's okay. That's what you want to do. So practical jokes wasn't a thing on our cutter. I'm sure on some other cutters it was. We were we were a tight knit brotherhood. We, we I got lucky because some crews are not. We were, you know, after we did our, our go to the grocery store, maybe go to the gym or this or that. We did want to be with each other. We wanted to go to a restaurant or a bar and spend time with him, with each other. When we pulled into West Point during um, ice breaking season, it was great because they have a small little mountain there, the MWR. It's a, a snowboarding mountain there and that's what we would do we would all go as a group go up there and snowboard and, and spend time together on our off time we visit each other's families so i don't know maybe we were more mature or maybe we just were too tired to, to do practical jokes <laughs> but I, I don't remember any and and how how often how long did you sleep at a time it depended the rotation really mattered every body counts and not only every body but every qualified person so that's why when you get on board, anxiety creeps in because everybody's pressuring you to get qualified. You got to get import qualified because if you're qualified, that means the rotation is that much better. Maybe you work, maybe you, you're on watch once every four days as opposed to once every two days. So you get to spend more time with your family when you're home or when we pull in somewhere, maybe you get to spend more time in that town that we're pulling into. Um, and the same thing underway. Underway, it's crucial to have as many people qualified because, you know, we have to be alert. Um, and so if you're working every four hours and sleeping every other four hours or whatever. It's just, you're tired, you're fatigued, it becomes dangerous. So I've stood watch for six to eight hours before and probably done it on two hours sleep. Um, Cause it's not just always regular operations too. It may be your turn to go to sleep and all of a sudden we have to do a drill. And those drills are important even when we're underway because that's what we're always doing. We're always preparing because you never know. It's practice, practice makes perfect for when it does happen. And thank God nothing ever went wrong, but it's just luck of a draw. If you, it happens to be your turn to go to, to, to take some rest or your turn to go eat and a drill goes down, you have to drop everything and take your position on the billet. Um, but right. it varies. The more guys, again, we're 18 man crew. Everybody has their own specialty and responsibility, but if one guy's out sick, somebody's not qualified or somebody rotates out to another unit, you, it hurts, it hurts a lot. Yeah, um, so Diane uh, mentioned the Miracle on the Hudson. That was a little bit before your time. Uh, yeah. But were there any other uh, major incidents that you were involved in or any particularly troublesome vessels you had to deal with uh, while you were working the harbor? Um, so yeah, to your point, I was, I reported, uh, 
long after that had happened, but there were some people on board that had been there for that. Um, but the only thing that comes to mind is coming up down the East River towards uh, the, the harbor at southern, in the southern point of Manhattan, there was a sailboat flipped over. I remember that. Um, usually bodies in the water, unfortunately, was a big thing on our radios. Um, the NYPD and our small boat station in Staten Island, they usually handled that, but just in case we were there. Um, most of the calls we got were to break out uh, fuel vessels up the Hudson, usually north of Poughkeepsie. That's where, you know, things got dicey. Um, but those were the calls that we got directly. But if, you know, keep an eye out for a body on the water, it was always an unfortunate call that we had to do. But, you know, our time there was pretty much normal ops, um, just security zones, being a platform in case anything was needed at the UN or when a president visited. Um, but yeah, th thank God things were calm. Um, just that, the major highlights were, you know, breaking barges out and then the oil spill, um, just visits by any government dignitaries that we had to provide security zones for. Um, and Mary asks um, if you ever uh, got to work or, or, or um, visit the, uh, the Bark Eagle, yes. the sailing ship. Yes. Yes, uh, that thing is beautiful. Um, they actually moored up in Staten Island once. Um, and since then, a lot of my peers um, that I've worked with um, when I was at Sector, um, I don't think anybody from my cutter has been assigned to the Eagle yet. But I know one of our cooks at Sector New York when, when I was there, uh, he, I actually ran into him in Key West this past fall. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Because I knew he, were, he retired. He goes, oh, they called me back. They asked if I wanted to go for another cruise. So he's the cook in the Bart Eagle. And my buddy, who's a marine science technician um, that I worked with at Sector New York, he's now a chief on the Eagle. Um, he just got that assignment. I visited. I never was assigned. Um, later, when, after I left the Surgeon Bay, I was, you know, after being a seaman, I became a yeoman. Um, I don't think there's any yeomans on board the Bart Eagle. Um, it's very officer heavy. And, and, but yeah, it's a beautiful ship. And I love when I see her whether it's on the Amtrak passing in London or wherever they are along the coast, it's great to see them. Yeah, and it visits New York every once in a while. So but I'm sure many people watching have, have seen it before. Um, so we're just about uh, out of time. Oh, Cindy just there sharing a, a picture of it so you can see. Um, so we're just about out of time, but uh, Ramon, Tell us a little bit about what you're up to today, and, and you're still a reservist, right? So what, what have been some of your responsibilities since you got off active duty? So since active duty, um, you know, most of my time has been as a yeoman, just dealing with incident command systems like ICS um, response. So, for example, Hurricane Florence was the last hurricane I participated in down. I went down to Virginia just to be part of the team that, you know, supplied equipment and, and personnel. You know, um, and then helping with border operations down in the southwest border um, with our, you know, because the Coast Guard is a hybrid. We're half DOD, we're half DHS. So we're a jack of all trades, like I said earlier. So we, we gave a hand down there. But that's usually reserve work um, now. Uh, it's just admin stuff in the office. Uh, and then once when an incident, heaven forbid, this hurricane becomes a bigger incident, then we'd be recalled for that. Um, so that's where my reservist world has lived in the last five years. It's just any major emergencies. If I'm qualified to go help and assist, I can take those orders and participate. Um, but all good. Um, it's the Coast Guard's fun. It's interesting. You never know. You may come in thinking you're going to do one thing, and you end up totally in a different department working with totally different people and services. And that's what, why I think it's great. It's good to be versatile and, and just be ready to serve the American public in, in whatever capacity we're, we're asked to do. And, and I think that's what reservists do. And it's why it's hard to leave completely sever ties with the Coast Guard because you always know when something happens, you want to be able to say, hey, raise your hand. I want to participate. So, but for now, reservist world, um, that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah. And it's such a small, it's such a small community too, right? They're, I think there are fewer members of the Coast Guard than there are of the NYPD. Yeah, so and you learn it quick. You learn it quick, no matter, like, again, I was walking down the street, and there's my buddy um, in Key West. Um, no matter where you go in the country, it's only one degree of separation. 
from the next coast because there's only so few of us. Everybody sooner or later works together in some capacity or at some unit. Um, we are very small and we have a large we have a large area of responsibility both here and abroad. Um, mm -hmm. I have friends that are in Bahrain. I have guys that have come back from Bahrain. I have guys that I've sent to Bahrain um, and other places around the world. So it, it's interesting. It's an interesting service. Um, and I think we our strength is that, that we work well with all the other services and agencies. And, and the biggest compliment we get is, man, we really love working with you guys. Hopefully they send you guys back to come with us. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Um, well, one last question I want to, to, uh, to ask. Um, Marilyn, we're going to get to your question about women in the Coast Guard. But um, Lewis asked if um, you ever had the opportunity to go to Governor's Island or talk to any of the students at the Harbor School. No, unfortunately, um, at that time, Governor's Island wasn't up and running. 2010. So right. let's put it this way: 2010, the barracks were still up on Governor's Island. It wasn't the beautiful oasis it is now. But I do remember. So, I, like I said at the beginning, the first time underway, Seaman Morales, 19-year-old, was breaking me in. There was two. Not only is the harbor scary if you don't know what you're doing, right? But two other things factored into my fear and anxiety. We had been in Charlie for three months, meaning the boat was not, hadn't been underway. They had been fixing it and, and doing work to it for three months before I reported. And that day we had a school, I'm not sure who it was, uh, but we had a school come on board so they can do some of their uh, tests on the waters. And so that was also anxiety driven. Our command, uh, Lieutenant Commander Ray at the time was very pro having schools come on board and, and, and learn about you know, marine life and, and, and the waterways. So I'm not sure if that's still something that they do. Every uh, commanding officer takes on different pet projects. But um, if you reach out to the sector of New York, I'm sure they, they'd be more than happy to accommodate or help out with that. Because again, one of our, our tasking is that environmental protection um, and what better way to teach the future um, about it by them experience through the water themselves. So. Great, well, well Ramon, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us. Um, and you know, we wish you the, the best of luck. You just, uh, you just wrapped up school, right? So I'm over at NYU right now. Yep. Uh, we did wrap up the spring semester. I'm just going for events management, thanks to the, the GI Bill, um, the 9-11 GI Bill that has been earned by so many veterans before me. Um, it's a great program. And so that's what I'm doing. And that's what brought me to Turn South Tours. I did my bachelor's at St. Joseph's College and I interned with Cindy and Andrew. And I learned so much that I, I'm always going to take with me. Greatest storytellers and, and, and research historians I've ever come across or heard of. So uh, uh, it was a blessing. And like, I'm still in the hospitality space. Yeah. Great. Well, again, thank you so much. Um, and if you have any questions, we can pass them along to Ramon. Uh, but we're going to move into the second half of our program. So, so thanks, Ramon. If, if you have to go, that's great. If you want to stick around and watch, um, that, thank you so much. There we go. All right. So, um, for the last you know, 25 minutes or so, we're now gonna dive into the actual history, but I think it was really important uh, to kind of put front and center you know, the experience uh, and the job of what the Coast Guard does today because uh, it's such an important service, but it's, it's you know, not, not as widely known, I think, um, by the general public. Uh, and so we had this great opportunity, Ramon was available, and, and so uh, we were so lucky to, to have him on. And we were so lucky to have him uh, as part of our team a couple of years ago at Turnstile Tours. But we're going to go back to the beginning. So today, uh, you know, is the 230th birthday uh, of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, and interestingly, the Coast Guard is actually really the oldest continuously operating maritime service. I know that ruffles a few feathers in the Navy. Uh, you know, the Navy's uh, was supposedly founded in, in 1775. Um, and, you know, the Navy served in the Revolutionary War, but they actually went through a period of about 12 years uh, between about 1885, uh, excuse me, 1785 uh, and 1797 when they didn't really have any ships in the U.S. Navy. So there was a period of time when the Coast Guard was the Navy. Um, it was really the only maritime force uh, that the United States has had at its, its disposal. Uh, and a lot of that early history uh, has deep connections to world, uh, deep connections to New York Harbor. So we're going to talk about those early days. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of connections to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. 
Um, we're going to talk about the world wars. We're going to talk about prohibition, and we're going to try and get as close as we can uh, to the present day in the time that we have. But but please feel free to drop any questions um, that you have in. Um, but I'm going to pull up uh, my slideshow one more time. Okay, so um, the sort of origin of the U.S. Coast Guard, um, it wasn't called the Coast Guard. It was called um, the United States uh, Revenue Service. Uh, and so its role was really to um, patrol the ports, uh, and especially because the vast majority of revenue that was coming to the United States federal government uh, was actually through tariffs. Uh, and so they were really enforcing the tariff and trade regime um, of the ports of the United States. And obviously New York being the largest and busiest port, you know, the revenue cutter service would have a significant presence. Uh, and so one of the first ships that was part of these original, I believe it was 10 revenue cover, cu cutter ships, um, was called the U.S. Revenue Cutter Vigilant, um, which was launched in 1791. Um, this is the Pickering, which is sort of a later generation and not one built in New York, um, but this gives you a sense of, of what these ships were like. Not very big, not terribly capable. And actually the first 10 ships were, were sort of scrapped within about 10 years um, of being launched because they were considered just underpowered, underarmed, um, and not really fully capable of, of doing the job um, that, they were, uh, that they were tasked with. Um, the uh, Vigilant um, is followed um, by another Vigilant that's built here. And then we have a series of revenue cutters um, that are built in the 1830s. And this is kind of where the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, enters the story. Um, now, according to most of the records that we have, um, the U.S. Navy Yard uh, at, at New York um, built three um, cutters for the revenue cutter service. Um, this one, the Gallatin, one called the Hamilton, uh, and one called the Morris. Uh, now, this is um, questionable um, because there are contradictory records about whether these ships were actually built uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard or whether they were built um, by the uh, shipbuilding firm uh, called Webb and Allen. Um, it's possible that Webb and Allen, we know that they designed the ships. It's possible that they built some at their own yard um, across the river in Corlier's Hook. Um, and they built some of them under contract at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but we don't have any record of this. And the reason for this is because the Treasury Department building in Washington, D.C. Uh, burned to the ground in, uh, in 1833. Uh, these ships were built between 1830 and 1832. So all of the records of uh, basically their construction um, were destroyed. So we don't really know, and maybe we'll never know, um, what the uh, exact answer is of where exactly these ships were built. But as far as we know, as far as we can tell, and according to the official history of the uh, U.S. Coast Guard, these ships were built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So, you know, we've been serving the Coast Guard uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard going all the way back um, to at least the 1830s. And of course, they were probably servicing these revenue cutter ships um, as well um, throughout that time. So this is a photo um, that was taken around the time of the Civil War. So the Gallatin served for um, in excess of 30 years. Um, the Morris actually um, was sunk um, only after about uh, 10 or 12 years uh, of service. Um, so, you know, it's a relatively small service. Um, there was actually a lot of criticism of the early revenue cutter service, um, accusations of a lot of graft. Um, they did generate a huge amount of revenue for the United States government, and some felt uh, in Congress that they were not spending that money wisely. The ships that they were building were not well designed. Um, they were way too expensive, way too expensive to operate. Uh, and because it was under the Department of Treasury, this was sort of like a little fiefdom. So there was a lot of kind of violation of the rules. We talked about this in the program we did a couple of weeks ago um, about uh, slavery um, and the connection to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And the Revenue cover, Cutter Service um, absolutely just flaunted the rules that enslaved people were not supposed to be serving on these ships, but officers would routinely bring them on. Um, so there's a lot of controversy, um, especially in the years leading up to the Civil War, about the way that the Revenue Cutter Service um, was operated. Now, 
the revenue cutter service is just one part of the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, you know, it, it officially becomes the U.S. Coast Guard in 1915 uh, when they merge a couple of, of different services. One is the Revenue Cutter Service, and the other is the United States Life Saving Service. And this also has a close connection um, to New York Harbor. So if you go to Greenwood Cemetery, um, you will find this monument. It's actually very close to Battle Hill, uh, if you know where that is, the highest point in Brooklyn. Um, so just a little bit to the west uh, of Battle Hill, you find um, this very large monument uh, to Thomas Freeborn. Um, Freeborn was a pilot. Uh, he was uh, a, a Sandy Hook pilot. Um, and what that means is uh, because New York Harbor is a difficult harbor to navigate, you want local knowledge. Um, and so dating back to the 17th century, we've had pilots um, who would go out to ships entering the harbor and help guide them into their berth uh, wherever, they were, wherever they were going. Um, so they were really the, the most skilled um, seamen uh, in the area. Uh, and so Thomas Freeborn was a Sandy Hook pilot. Um, he went out to meet a ship called the John Minturn. Uh, and while he was going out to meet them, a, a storm came up. Now, today, the Sandy Hook pilots uh, are very well organized. They have standardized pricing. But back in those days, um, the pilots would actually race against one another and bid against one another uh, to be the pilot for ships coming in. So after an extended period of haggling, uh, Thomas Freeborn was finally taken on uh, the John Minturn, but by that time it was actually too late to escape the storm. Um, and so rather than going into the harbor, they were blown down the coast of New Jersey, uh, where you can see it's engraved on his, um, on his tombstone um, that the Minturn uh, foundered and um, ultimately sunk, um, killing 38 people, uh, including Thomas Freeborn. His, his body washed up on the shore a couple of days uh, later. Um, and so this is what it looked like, which was um, a uh, famous um, uh, etching, uh, or excuse me, a lithograph done by Courier and Ives. Um, so this happened in 1846. Two years later, largely as a result of this, this accident became very famous, but there are a lot of other very, very tragic accidents um, in the New York and New Jersey area um, that sparked the creation in 1848 by Congress of the U.S. Life Saving Service. Um, uh, initially, Congress provided very little funding, but they were able to establish stations along the coast um, where they could send out boats and ropes to help rescue people who might be on ships that were foundering um, offshore. Um, it's formally organized with a paid staff um, in 1871, um, but really we can trace back to its origin, you know, really Thomas Freeborn and, and the case of the, of the John Minturn, you know, which He's buried you know, right, right in Brooklyn in Greenwood Cemetery. Um, so 1871 is when it's formally organized. And then in 1915, it's all kind of subsumed up into the, um, up into the uh, what would become known as the United States Coast Guard. Uh, I see we have a question here. Uh, Ronan asks whether there are any archives uh, recovered um, after the Treasury building burned down in 1833. Um, I'm not exactly sure. As far as I know, everything that was housed in that building was, was basically destroyed in the fire. Many records obviously had been published uh, or existed in other places, but you know, most of the records of the U.S. Revenue Cutter Service, as far as we know, had not up to that time been, been reproduced and published, um, at least not relating to the shipbuilding. Uh, so as far as we know, those, um, those are gone. Um, there's a third kind of branch uh, of the Coast Guard and one that we mentioned in our conversation uh, with Ramon, um, and that is the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Um, so they manage um, lighthouses, it aids to navigation, um, and in 1939, um, this is absorbed into the U.S. Coast Guard as well. And that's one of the key missions of the Coast Guard today um, is safe navigation of, of U.S. waterways. So that includes maintaining all of these aids, including lighthouses and buoys, um, but also doing things like, um, you know, creating safety regulations for boating um, and also certifying mariners uh, of all different levels, you know, um, from, you know, uh, basically, the rules and regulations for pleasure boating, all the way up to you know masters of um, uh, of large ocean-going ships. Um, so, in that sense, the history goes back even further. 
um, right here in the New York area. So this is the Sandy Hook Light, uh, which I have my dates correct. I believe it was constructed in 1764. So this is the oldest still operating lighthouse uh, in the United States. Um, so you can even push the Coast Guard history even farther back uh, if you, um, you know, take into account places like this and the work uh, of the, the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Um, thank you so much to Cindy um, for giving plug to the, uh, the LILAC, um, which was uh, Mary uh, was a guest on our program uh, earlier in the year. Um, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Mary, uh, for joining us. Um, but we should also mention that we did a program about the Robbins Reef Lighthouse with the Noble Maritime Collection. Uh, we did a program just the other day with South Street Seaport where we talked about the lightship um, service as well. We haven't had them on yet, but maybe we will sometime soon, uh, which is the National Lighthouse Museum uh, in Staten Island. Um, so there's lots of different institutions around New York Harbor that are preserving uh, what really is the history of the Coast Guard um, uh, even if you don't think of them explicitly as sort of Coast Guard museums. Okay, so let's uh, jump ahead to World War I. So 1915 is when the Coast Guard is, is reorganized. Um, and actually throughout American history, um, the first the Revenue Cutter Service uh, and then the formal Coast Guard, um, uh, under U.S. law, they actually, um, in times of war, uh, become subsumed by the U.S. US Navy. Now, something that Ramon mentioned, he said that, you know, he had um, colleagues in the Coast Guard who served in Bahrain. You know, the Coast Guard served in the Arctic and then the Antarctic. So even today, not in times of war, um, we have, or not in times of formally declared war, uh, we have, um, you know, Coast Guard, uh, the Coast Guard is serving, you know, all over the globe. Um, but you know, during the World Wars, um, they, they did as well. Uh, and so they were serving um, directly in the theaters of battle and, and serving on combat ships. Um, this is another image um, of Greenwood Cemetery, um, and it commemorates really the largest loss of the Coast Guard in the First World War. Um, and this was a ship um, called the USS Tampa, um, which was sunk um, off the um, coast of... Um, of, of Britain, um, actually in the Bristol Channel, uh, which is where it was torpedoed by a German U-boat, and 111 uh, Coast Guardsmen were killed on board that ship, um, including um, right here, uh, Roy Ackerman Bothwell. Um, and so this is actually a picture of him uh, that was published in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. Um, and he also, that family also lost his brother uh, who served in the army um, in, in World War I. So the Coast Guard, um, at least, as it connects to, to New York Harbor, um, has a relatively small role. Um, they are very worried, uh, obviously, about the threat of German U-boats to American shipping, um, but U-boats generally have relatively short range. It's hard for them to get all the way from Germany to the United States, um, although they do appear off Cape Cod and actually sink a number of ships right off Cape Cod. Um, but the threat is less immediate um, to the American coast um, in World War I, it certainly would be in World War II, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a, a couple of minutes. Um, but in between the wars, the Coast Guard takes on another um, important and interesting role, um, and that is because America is still at war uh, after World War, uh, or shortly after World War I ends, um, but rather than being at war against uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary, uh, we're at war against alcohol. Um, so prohibition is instituted uh, in 1920. Uh, and obviously, because the Coast Guard is part of the, um, the Treasury Department, um, this sort of falls uh, under, their, under their purview. Um, but the Coast Guard, you know, is relatively small service, um, and they need to uh, beef up a little bit. Um, and so this is actually an image taken at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, because the U.S. Navy transfers a number of um, aging destroyers to the Coast Guard um, for really patrolling uh, what's known as the rum line. Uh, so New York was really an epicenter of, um, of rum running, of, of, bringing, you know, uh, seized, uh, bringing illegal alcohol into the United States. Obviously some of it was produced illegal in the US, but a lot of it is brought in uh, from overseas. Um, and the rum line essentially was a series of old hulks of, of ships that were moored 
you know, right outside the territorial waters of the United States. So they could almost act like these floating warehouses that alcohol might be brought in from Europe or might be brought in from Canada. And then they would bring it into New York in smaller batches on, on much faster ships. Uh, and so the Coast Guard was tasked with uh, tracking these down. Um, they weren't very successful. Uh, like I said, they're getting these aging destroyers from the US Navy. They're not very fast, not very capable. Uh, and so the rum runners could actually quite easily outrun them um, and, and get into port uh, without the Coast Guard bothering them. Although, you know, they did certainly have their success. So this is a picture um, showing all of these crates um, that, are, that are wrapped in sacks uh, that were captured by the Coast Guard, um, all containing whiskey um, that were brought in. Um, a little bit of a, a press event. You can see all the people gathered along the fence uh, in the back here uh, watching as this Coast Guard cutter comes in drop it off. So like with so much of the, you know, law enforcement of prohibition, the Coast Guard had middling success. Um, they weren't able to really break the back um, of the rum running, you know, coming into New York or other parts of the United States, you know, it was actually a, a big problem in places like Rhode Island, uh, in part because there's this archipelago, all these islands, lots of places for, for bootleggers to hide. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, Mary, thank you for mentioning uh, about the lightship Diamond Shoals uh, that's sunk by a, a German U-boat off the coast of North Carolina in World War I. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so we're going to jump ahead a little bit. So we're talking about the, um, we're talking about Prohibition. Prohibition ends in 1933, um, and the Coast Guard actually starts to get built up a little bit. They're, they start to build a new class of ships uh, in the late 1930s, um, and a few of them were built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so here we can see the launching of two sister ships, uh, uh, the Coast Guard cutters Alexander Hamilton and, and John C. Spencer. Uh, most Coast Guard cutters, at least back in these days, were named after secretaries of the Treasury. Um, and these are interesting ships because they were some of the first ships that were actually built uh, in dry docks uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So rather than building them on shipways, which is building them on dry land, essentially on a big ramp, launching them into the water, they're building them in these dry dock basins um, and then just flooding the basin and allowing the ship to, to float up. A lot less dramatic kind of launching, um, but you can see that they were, the two ships were built in the same dry dock and launched um, officially christened at the same time. Now, what's interesting is that the Coast Guard actually utilized a design um, that was built for the Navy. Um, so essentially, it's a modified um, gunboat. Um, and they were modeled on uh, both the design as well as the method of construction, a ship, ship built just a year earlier called the USS Erie. Um, so here you can see the Erie under construction uh, in dry dock number one. So this is the very first ship of the Brooklyn Navy Yard that's actually built in a dry dock. Um, and so um, they learned a lot from the construction of the Erie uh, and all the subsequent um, uh, cutters of this class would be built sort of, uh, sort of on this model. Um, so we built two at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and then they built uh, a bunch more. I believe they built six more um, down at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Um, now one of these, uh, the US uh, Coast Guard cutter Alexander Hamilton uh, is actually sunk uh, in very er in early 1942, January 29th, 1942. Now, I mentioned before that we're going to do a program on September 2nd uh, about the uh, USS Arizona and the USS Missouri. And of course, the Arizona is known as um, the ship that was sunk at Pearl Harbor. So we consider that kind of the first ship that was sunk uh, in, uh, in the Pacific, uh, in uh, first American ship that was sunk in the Pacific in World War II. Um, this is really at least after war is declared, this is the first American ship that's sunk in the Atlantic. Um, so it's operating um, off the coast of Iceland uh, when it's uh, hit by uh, a German torpedo. Um, and it doesn't sink immediately. Um, it actually sort of lists for a little bit um, and then eventually it, it completely capsizes. Um, and what's interesting is um, they actually learned a lot from the sinking of this, that ship that led to modifications of all the other ships. And, um, so this right here is another ship um, that has a connection to Pearl Harbor, sort of a, a first or rather a last. Um, this is the, the cutter um, Taney or Tawny, uh, which is down in Baltimore, uh, although it's recently had its nameplates removed because of the really 
terrible associations with uh, Roger Tawney and the um, Dred Scott decision. Uh, so they're re-examining the, the naming and the um, sort of labeling of this ship. Um, but anyway, it's part of the historic ships of Baltimore. Um, and it's the last ship that was in Hawaii during the attack in Pearl Harbor um, that's still afloat. Um, so it's sort of, it's called the last survivor of Pearl Harbor. Anyway, if you go aboard this ship and you go into the engine room, you see this. And what you're seeing here uh, is actually the, the shadow of a bulkhead door. So this used to be the door into the engine room and you can see it was welded shut. Um, and this was actually welded shut uh, in 1942, shortly after the sinking of the Hamilton. And the reason why is because when the Hamilton was hit by that torpedo, um, this door was open and it bent this frame. Uh, and so what that meant was they were not able to close the door and seal the engine room. And you can see here the ship um, is, is uh, the bow is sinking, uh, excuse me, the stern is sinking here um, because those compartments are filling up with water. Um, and so they basically decided after this happened um, to retrofit uh, all of these cutters um, to basically remove this door. It was seemed un deemed unnecessary and actually um, you know, compromise the safety and structural integrity of the ship. So you can see right here, because this door was still there on the Hamilton, the Hamilton sunk. It probably could have survived um, that torpedoing if, if that door wasn't there. Um, so you can see a little bit of a sort of a shadow of, of uh, the story of the Hamilton uh, when you go on board the Tawny here. All right. Um, just a couple other stories I want to mention here, because I know we have about three minutes left. Um, I'll just mention that the Spencer uh, sort of uh, got a bit of revenge um, for its sister ship, the Hamilton, um, because in 1943, um, it ends up uh, sinking a U-boat, U-132, um, as it's uh, serving in convoy duty. So that's what a lot of Coast Guard ships did. Um, they actually protected convoys um, going across uh, the North Atlantic. So um, they were fighting in the Battle of the Atlantic and, and fighting through you know, one of the major battle zones of World War II, not just protecting uh, coastal areas. Um, here's another ship with a great connection to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, this is the USS Menges. Now the USS Menges was a uh, Coast Guard, uh, excuse me, was a um, destroyer escort. Um, and it is a USS right here, but uh, as I said, the US Navy was, uh, it, it subsumed the Coast Guard during the war. And so this was actually a destroyer escort that was completely crewed by members of the Coast Guard. Um, and this was hit by a German torpedo in 1944 um, while it was doing convoy duty in the Mediterranean. And you can see the massive damage uh, that it suffered um, to its stern right here. Um, it was thought that this ship might be a total loss um, it was first brought to North Africa and then towed um, to, the, uh, to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, where they just happened to have another severely damaged destroyer escort of the same type called the USS Holder. And so what did they do? Um, they cut the two ships in half and they stuck the two halves together. <coughs> so here you can see, this is the seam right here. Um, where they fit them together. And when they put those two pieces together, they actually fit within one and a half inches. Um, so it's a real, we tell this story all the time because it's a real testament to the incredible uh, skill and, um, and ingenuity uh, of the ship workers uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And this ship went back into service just a couple of weeks later, protecting convoys in the North Atlantic. And, and the following year, 1945, it actually also participated in the sinking uh, of a U-boat. Um, can't talk about the history of uh, the Coast Guard in New York City uh, without mentioning Manhattan Beach. Uh, Manhattan Beach was the Coast Guard uh, training center, um, the largest in the country. Uh, and so this is where you would go you know, through your boot camp. Today, the boot camp um, is down in uh, Cape May, New Jersey. Um, but one of the major ones in World War II uh, was, was in Manhattan Beach. And today, um, the footprint of it is now uh, within uh, Kingsboro Community College. Um, the other important thing to note about the Coast Guard during World War II is that this was probably the most integrated service. Um, it had the largest proportion of, of African Americans in service, and they actually served on integrated crews, which is something that did not happen in the U.S. Navy uh, during World War II. 
Um, maybe the most famous member of the Coast Guard on the left here, this is Jack Dempsey. He worked at uh, Manhattan Beach Training Station uh, teaching hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, he actually wrote a book for the Coast Guard called How to Fight Tough. Um, and they actually had a number of uh, professional boxers here. This is Tiny Wyatt right here on the left, uh, who was a heavyweight contender. Um, so uh, yeah, Jack Dempsey really put his, put his stamp on the Coast Guard. Um, this is also uh, a person uh, who's standing in the front here, Olivia Hooker. She's someone we've talked about before, but I just love to, to mention her story. Um, she's actually from Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, and she passed away a couple of years ago I believe she was 106 years old, um, but she is considered the last survivor of the Tulsa race riot of 1921. Um, that's something um, that we hear a lot about uh, in the news uh, recently with Black Lives Matter. Um, but she actually, you know, after her family's business and home was destroyed in the Tulsa race riot, um, she eventually found herself in New York City and uh, she volunteered for the Women's Auxiliary of the Coast Guard, which is called the SPARS. And she was one of the first uh, female African-American members uh, of the SPARS here. Um, and she spent the rest of her life in Brooklyn, actually. Um, and uh, as Ramon mentioned, our galley uh, in uh, uh, Sector New York uh, was named in honor uh, of Olivia Hooker. So that's, that's a great connection right there. Um, this is, so we're kind of getting into the, the post-World War II period. Um, this is something I, I highly recommend if you um, check out uh, Portside, New York, uh, which uh, has the ship Mary Whalen and Red Hook. They have a great website called Water Stories. This is the one that they mention. Uh, this was a, an interesting incident in 1963, um, a Coast Guard tug called the uh, Cutter uh, Tamarora uh, was actually undergoing repairs in uh, the Robbins Dry Dock uh, in Red Hook. Um, what happened was uh, the, the ship was up in this floating dry dock and one of the members of the crew came back to the ship late at night um, and the uh, people on guard decided that he was too drunk to come on board and so they wouldn't let him go uh, come on board so they told him to go find some place to sleep it off uh, and he wasn't very happy about that and so what he did instead was he came back climbed down into the dry dock and opened the valves of the dry dock um, and so that caused the dry dock to sink and unfortunately because work was being done on the tamarora um, all of its valves were open and it filled with water and sank um, so this was a, a big incident and actually led to a, a big um, case um, court case um, which determined that actually the Coast Guard was liable because it was one of their service members who actually caused the accident. Uh, but this ship eventually was, it was raised and, and um, it, it survived uh, this, this incident. Uh, and actually just last year, I believe it was, um, it was sunk off the coast of New Jersey as, as a reef. So it actually served well into the 1990s as a Coast Guard, a Coast Guard ship. But I just like to mention that. So, um, now we're getting into the kind of the last part of the history. Um, so the, the last stage of, of uh, Coast Guard history in New York Harbor um, happens in 1966. Um, and that's because, uh, as we know, we had this um, base realignment and closure process in 1964 that led to the closure of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, but also the Army's base on Fort, uh, called Fort J on Governor's Island. But rather than shut it down and sell it to the city, what they did instead was transfer it to the Coast Guard. So from 1996, 1966 to 1996, uh, this is really the largest Coast Guard base uh, in the country. Um, and so a lot of the buildings that you find there, like uh, Ramon mentioned about the barracks and things that are there, um, you know, date to this, this time period. Um, and so what they did was really consolidate all of the operations around the harbor onto Governor's Island. This was very, very expensive to operate. It was really a city within a city for the Coast Guard. I believe at its peak, it had about 4,000 people living there. Um, and uh, the, um, basically the Coast Guard decided uh, in the 90s that they, they didn't really wanna pay for it anymore. It wasn't really necessary. They had a much too large a footprint uh, in New York Harbor. 
Um, and so it was transferred to the city of New York and is now you know, being transformed into parkland and we have the Harbor School there um, and all sorts of different, um, different facilities there. Um, but it does have that, that 30 year period of, of Coast Guard history. And thank you so much for Mary, to Mary for mentioning the earlier history of the Cutter Tamaroa, which uh, was actually uh, served in the Navy as the USS Zuni. Um, so what about the Coast Guard today? Um, as we know, we still have Coast Guard um, is present in New York Harbor and actually they're the largest um, service, uh, of armed service um, in, in New York Harbor. Um, even though the Army still has a base at um, Fort Hamilton, um, the Coast Guard has a much, much larger presence. There's over a thousand personnel uh, that serve in New York Harbor and they primarily serve um, at the base uh, where uh, Ramon was working over in Bayonne uh, and then here j just um, outside Fort Wadsworth um, uh, on Staten Island, uh, which is the former U.S. quarantine station, as you can see here uh, coming in. Um, and so again, because New York Harbor is really the second busiest harbor in the United States, we need the Coast Guard here to provide that security, but also to provide all of the aids to navigation and make sure the harbor uh, is running safely and securely. Um, one last thing I want to mention about Coast Guard presence that we still have a connection to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and that it's one of the main yards for uh, repairing Coast Guard cutters. So it's almost continuous that we have a Coast Guard cutter um, that's in one of the dry docks at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, dry dock one gets used a lot, but so do the larger ones, dry docks five and six. Um, so I, I took this uh, photo a couple years ago. One, one thing about the cutters though is that we, we have a number of cutters that have come online in the last couple of years, but they're a pretty small part of the fleet. The, the main bulk of the fleet uh, is frankly in excess of 30 years old, um, and some of them even older than that. Uh, so they, they do require a lot of maintenance because these are really workhorses. Um, nobody does more with less than the U.S. Coast Guard. You know, they have something like 35,000 uh, members in uniform, that's it. Uh, and they have to patrol, you know, all the coasts, the massive coasts of the United States. You know, that includes Alaska, that includes the Arctic Ocean. It also includes places like McMurdo Sound, the uh, research station uh, down in Antarctica. So they have a huge area to, to cover. Um, and that brings me to a question that we had earlier, which is where are Coast Guard ships built today? Um, so there are a number of shipyards that build, uh, build ships for the Coast Guard. They're primarily in the Gulf Coast. Um, so that includes um, Bollinger Shipyards, which is in Louisiana, um, the um, Pascagoula Shipyard of Huntington Ingalls. Um, they're building the new um, national security cutters. Uh, and then VT Halter Marine, which is also down at the Gulf Coast, is building the new, um, new icebreakers uh, for the Coast Guard as well. Um, Ronan asks, what's the busiest harbor in the U.S. Um, if New York is the second busiest? It's Los Angeles. And generally, New York, the Port of New York and New Jersey and the Port of Long Beach sort of uh, jockey back and forth for the second busiest. Um, so New York sort of fits in between because the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach are considered separate, even though they're right next to each other. Um, but I'm sorry we went so over today. We had a lot of ground to cover. I just want to thank everybody so much for joining us. I'll just show one last picture right here. I took this picture the other day. Uh, this is uh, a Coast Guard ship that we have in dry dock number one right now as we speak at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, this is the, um, the Catherine Walker. Um, so you can go back and watch the program we did uh, with the Noble Maritime Collection to learn more about uh, the namesake uh, of this ship. Um, yeah, and as Ramon just mentioned, yes, the Coast Guard also has its own shipyard um, down in Baltimore. So that's where they do a lot of, uh, some of the maintenance, um, but a lot of the maintenance is done by private shipyards uh, like GMD uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, great. So, um, I just want to thank everybody so much. I don't want to make anyone stick around any longer. Normally we try and keep these programs to an hour, but thank you so much for, for sticking around um, to the very end. Thank you so much to Ramon uh, for joining us. Um, if anyone has any uh, last questions you'd like to ask before we sign off, I'll just mention uh, that again, um, we have some great programs coming up related to maritime history um, and not. We have some great food programs coming up as well. So join us again. Our next program will be on Friday, August 7th. Uh, we're gonna talk about Coney Island and the cats of Coney Island through the art of our friend, uh, Rev. Jen Miller. Uh, then on the 8th, we're gonna talk about Hunts Point um, through a board game. 
Uh, and then on August 10th, uh, we have folks from the, stat, uh, from the City Island Nautical Museum. We're going to talk about the rich boat building history, and we'll definitely talk about pilots um, in that program as well, uh, like we talked about Thomas Freeborn and John Minturn earlier today. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, please consider joining our upcoming programs, and please consider becoming a member. Uh, we really, really appreciate your support, and we're able to do this robust programming. Uh, thanks to that support and your subscription. Um, and we're going to keep doing these as long as we possibly can. Um, so anything you can contribute is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, and we'll see you on Friday. Thanks so much.